I want to welcome everyone today to the Rodeo webinar entitled Collaboration for Health IT, Designed to Support Research. I'm, D I'm David Capelli, the Rodeo Director. I want to thank you all for, for joining us today uh, in our, in our uh, web, web series. So, So before we, we um, introduce our speakers for today, I wanted to share a little bit about um, Rodeo and what Rodeo is. So Rodeo is the repository of oral health data for evaluation and outcomes. Uh, Rodeo is a statewide database of basic screening survey oral health indicators, access to care information, and demographic data. Programs across Texas contribute data annually. Each year, the data are synthesized and published on the Rodeo website, and the data is available for public access. Rodeo is a partnership between UT Health San Antonio School of Dentistry and the Oral Health Program at the Texas Department of State Health Services. Rodeo is supported by funding from the Health Resources and Services Administration. So this webinar series aims to bring dental public health information and initiatives to both Rodeo users and contributors, as well as our national partners who are interested in learning more about the oral health of people living in Texas. You can learn more about Rodeo by visiting the website www.rodeo.org, and it's R-O-H-D-E-O.org. So before we start the webinar, I just want to review a few housekeeping details with you. Uh, the webinar will last approximately 45 minutes, after which Dr. Shvalek, Johnson, and Jen, Jen, Janus, Janus will answer questions. If you have a question, please type it in the question box. If typing um, in the chat or question, please make sure that you are typing to the entire audience or sending to all. At the conclusion, the presenters will read and answer questions. If they don't have the time to answer your question, or if you have a follow-up question, we'll provide their slides and contact information on the Rodeo website. Or you can email us at the rodeo.utusca.edu. So it's, um, and we'll connect you uh, with the speaker. So this webinar is being recorded and will be made available for review later on the Rodeo website. You can review any previous webinars on the Rodeo website under the resources tab and would encourage you to take advantage of that opportunity. This webinar will set the stage by explaining the founding principles of the Collaboration for Health IT and how these how three dental schools in collaboration with Internet2 and ICE Health Systems created a vision to develop an electronic de dental record that supports their missions as research intensive institutions. The webinar will touch on current barriers to the vision and connect current efforts to the national initiative of the learning health system. The presenters will conclude by triggering a discussion with the question what would an electronic health record or EHR system look like that dentists suddenly can't live without? So let me take this opportunity to introduce our three speakers for this afternoon. Dr. Lynn Johnson is the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs and Institutional Effectiveness at the University of Michigan School of Dentistry. Prior to her appointment at Michigan, she was the Director of Educational Methodology and Instructional Technology for the University of Iowa College of Dentistry. She is an active member of the IADR and IDEA and serves as a charter member for the iTunes U Advisory Board with Apple. Dr. Mark Jenis is the President and CEO at ICE Health Systems located in Alberta, Canada. His previous work includes working as a clinical psychologist, founding the National Foundation for Family Research and Education, and spending nearly 20 years as president of Essential Talk. 
He has led the conceptual and practical development of ICE and in, an entirely new generation of EHR systems. Our third presenter today is Dr. Heiko Spalek. Dr. Spalek serves as the acting dean at the University of Sydney Faculty of Dentistry. Prior to joining the faculty in Sydney, Professor Spalek served as associate dean at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Spalek graduated with his DMD and PhD from the Humboldt University. He earned an MSBA from Temple University while appointed there. Dr. Spalek has published more than 50 peer-reviewed papers and a textbook for dental informatics. So please join us in welcoming these three distinguished speakers. I know this is going to be a very rich and rewarding um, webinar. Thank you very much for attending. So greetings, this is Lynn Johnson, and I'm going to start the webinar, and then it'll be followed by Mark Jenis and Heiko Spalik. So very quickly, let me show you, talk about the agenda. I will be talking about the collaboration and its founding principles, and then Mark will give a demonstration of ICE. And then finally, Heiko will talk about our vision for research. On to disclosures, uh, let me be clear that uh, the University of Michigan is the sponsoring institution of this project with Internet2. And we've received no financial compensation, and I personally have filed any conflict of interest, conflict of commitment documentation that the university requires. Heiko, again, no financial compensation. He has received an un unrestricted travel support to attend national meetings. And he also has filed the necessary information uh, required by the University of Sydney. And then finally, Mark is the owner and founder of ICE Health Systems. So why a collaboration? It is for those of us who have used electronic health records, we know that they're a foundational tool and the data that's used uh, in them or compiled by them can be used for research purposes and to around personal and population health. However, however, uh, frequently research is an afterthought and these systems are not built to support research. So we thought that researchers should be driving the software development and not relying on the technologists to do it. And we were fortunate to find uh, a company with a CEO with background in research uh, who understands and supports that need. All right, so with research first, let me show you talk briefly about how we get work done and how we are organized. We have an advisory board. Um, Mark, could we go to the next slide, please? Yep, there you are. We have an advisory board, and as work needs to be done, the advisory board pulls together uh, a working group. The working group can, from across, where, whatever we need, whatever uh, expertise we need, uh, we reach out and we find those groups. So this is just a brief, these are the highlights of work that has been completed. You'll see Carrie's coding, Carrie's charting, diagnostic codes, work on data migration. Oh, not yet. Back one, please. <laughs> okay. Um, billing, paracharting, orthocharting, security, legal agreements, single sign-on, two-factor authentication, and telehealth. All this work has been completed and developed. Um, and the red circles are those codes, carries codes and diagnostic codes that support, specifically, that support research. 
what work are we doing now? Uh, okay, let me wait just a moment for the slide. Yep. Implementation of telehealth is going. Security. Notice all of these are green because they continue, even though work is done, they continue to be improved. Security is ongoing. ICE Health Systems is a cloud-based electronic health record, and security is paramount. Uh, so there's, we'll talk more about security, but it is, it will never stop. We continue to do work on training materials as new versions of ICE are rolled out. How to implement a cloud EHR. There's always research questions, and Heiko will talk more about that. We bring patient care deans together, uh, electronic prescriptions, dental labs, grading, patient portal, oral pathology charting, EPIC integration, and always billing and testing. Although these systems do great at billing, we're focused on the research portion. Let me talk about EPIC integration just briefly. EPIC happens to be at academic medical centers the most popular uh, electronic medical record. And we are working at least closely here at Michigan. We are able to pull data out of EPIC and now move it into ICE. Uh, I will tell you that going the other way, moving from the dental school data we've curated and putting it into our hospital's EPIC system is kind of a political conversation, to say it nicely. It's going to take a while to have that happening smoothly. In the beginning, I'm going to go on to founding principles now. When we first started this project, we had seven founding principles. I'm not going to talk very much about the first three, other than mentioned that we want good clinical experiences for our practitioners. We want to support student learning and have good collaboration and communication practices. But it's the next ones, uh, and of course, the best software engineering practices. But it's the last four that I want to spend some time on, because those are key to supporting research and one of our most one of the research topics we are most interested in is a learning health system. Security. Uh, from the beginning, we wanted to exceed security regulations. Um, and working with Internet 2, that was extremely beneficial because they introduced us to a Cloud Security Alliance, which is a standard security standard. Uh, Next slide, please. Mark, can you go to the next slide? Ah. Okay. That's fine. <laughs> you can stay there. Um, <laughs> Feel free to guide me. For some reason, I'm having issues hearing. I only hear about every third sentence, so do feel free to guide me. I apologize. Okay, okay. Then I will uh, wait for slides to progress. All right, when it comes to security, Internet 2 uh, introduced us to a standard called the Cloud Security Alliance, which um, we were struggling to find the right security standard, I'll be honest, because very few health records are have undergone third party security reviews. So Internet 2 introduced us to a standard and then Michigan did a third party review of ICE. ICE is now moving beyond what we did and what you see is they are striving for what's called ISO 27001, um, that work. And so this year they are doing uh, what's called a SOC 2, and then a SOC 2 Type 2 will be in, in 19 with the idea that ISO 2701 is attained the following year. And why that, the reason that is important is that that means they will continually undergo audits to make sure all their new code and capability meets the security standards uh, that we've set. Um, right now, we at Michigan are working with ICE to make sure that happens, but then we will be able to hand it off and it will be done 
by a third party, such as KPMG. Okay, Mark, next slide, please. And I'll wait for it. Next slide. Great. So from the very beginning, we want, these are standards we're using. And from the very beginning, we wanted to make sure that we did not invent standards. Um, so ICDAS we use, that's carries classification data, SNO DDS, those are dental diagnostic codes, ICD-10 for all the medical codes, talked a bit about ISO 2701, Shibboleth, is again this is a uh, internet 2 standard um, it's for single sign-on so it securely allows us to log on to ice with the same id and password that our university uses for us to log on to email for example hl7 fire allows data interchange between applications um, and then the International Conference on Harmonization Guidelines for Good Clinical Practice. Uh, this is a unified standard that the EU, Japan, and the US uses to facilitate the acceptance of clinical data. Uh, so again, that's important. And finally, HICO is on the standards committee for the ADA that helps set many of these standards. So thank you for that, HICO. So, Okay, next slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. So right now, uh, we run reports on the data in our electronic health record. And we don't, we want to stop that 100%. So ICE now will enable us to move from reports that are a snapshot in time to dynamically updated dashboards that are embedded in ICE. So the researcher gets to establish the criteria and they can say easily within ICE what data they want and literally it can be updated every minute and you can establish trends, etc. And I think Mark is going to show some of that. Uh, next slide. That's it, okay. And the last element I wanted to mention is interoperability. And remember we talked about uh, HL7 and FHIR. Uh, what we are doing by using standards is we have, we, ICE has uh, built interoperability with Google Glass, Lexicon, which is a drug database, a medical support system, and Fitbit. And as a matter of fact, you see just a quick screen grab of uh, Fitbit data going into ICE and being displayed there. Underway right now is integration with MyPax. I mentioned Epic. And we are slowly moving forward, getting, we have to get through some security hurdles here um, in our integration with dose spot of electric prescription system, electronic prescription system. All right, I'm now gonna move it over to Mark for a demonstration. Thank you very kindly then. Um, let me invite you if you don't mind as I'm uh, going through, if you're having trouble hearing me, to kindly let me know um, as I was having a bit of trouble uh, getting consistency in your audio. Welcome everyone, my name is Mark Jenis and it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to provide just a, a, a brief demonstration of some of the components that Lynn touched on uh, within the system. It's a live demo. Um, I am online on a wireless connection uh, outside of the office and so it's a sort of true uh, demo if you will and I'll be interested in your thoughts and questions. Just a little bit about the structure as we go into the system. The way that the collaboration has guided ICE is in generally this form. So of course, <clears throat> there is a patient chart and a patient record and we'll look a little bit at the patient chart around 
uh, entering data for ICDOS, for example, to hopefully see that the, your colleagues have found, uh, have been very sensitive to the ease of data entry from a clinician, as well as the ease of data out for the researcher. There's a provider dashboard, and this just allows a clinician or an administrator, a financial person or a researcher to see personalized information on uh, that they wish, and we'll show you that. And then a practice lever dashboard where an area effectively you can do some business intelligence. We've been working with uh, Julian Fisher at Hanover Medical School on a presentation for the WHO, and I'll show you the, some of the work uh, that he's put together within the system and some of the customized data uh, and expanded data outside of what's generally considered a normal health record that he's helped us put in. There's also a patient portal area and an area for professional collaborations. We won't get into those today uh, because they've restricted me to 15 minutes. So um, I won't be able to take the rest of the afternoon, but I uh, would be happy to do that another time as I enjoy showing this off just a little bit too much. Uh, the other component that the collaboration built in is Lynn talked about interoperability and she talked about standards and all are very critical from a collaborative perspective the other aspect of that is a concept of sharing um, this way as working groups are working on content and information even asking interesting questions and creating interesting reports and so forth there needed to be a way for the professional community to share that information easily and efficiently so you can do that within let's say the university of michigan within the school but what about another university let's say in mexico or in another country or across the country wishing to collaborate with them do joint research and use uh, jointly some of the same content in the same work. So uh, within the system, an item you don't see, but within there as well, is the ability to share forms and reports and information such as that across accounts so that you can truly adapt and adopt standards across institutions so that you can work together properly. And then out from there, the uh, collaboration has also had the team build the concept of data warehousing. One important slightly technical component is because Heiko and Lynn and the others thought through the concept of supporting research from the very beginning. The architects designing the system have built a data structure and a mechanism for the data structure so that everyone has exactly the same data structure. There's lots of customization and configuration and all sorts of things. However, the base data structure that every account has is the same. And what that allows us to do is allows us to do warehousing of accounts together from anywhere in the world in real time so that we can bring accounts together very, very quickly. Researchers can be seeing up-to-date information from all over the world at any time. And so hopefully making research um, efficient, uh, making the data increasingly reliable and valid with the standards uh, and hopefully shortening the time that the Institute of Medicine, um, if you will, wrote about being 17 years to get information to application, hopefully reducing that time because of the efficiency of the data structure and the ease of access for the professional community. So that's a little bit about the structure of it. If I may, I'm just going to go in and provide a brief demonstration of a couple of these components and concepts in the system. So here we're on using Google Chrome, and here is a very simple front page. As Lynn said, one item is connection with Shibboleth. Uh, also, any SAML2 compliant uh, single sign-on system. So we're using Google at ISO as such. I don't have a username and password. I single click and get in. And it knows who I am. It's properly and appropriately secure and so forth. Okay. So within here, um, there is a practice level, a provider level, and a patient level dashboard. And I'm just going to go straight over to the practice level. And I'll show you the work that Julian uh, was doing and presented to the WHO Congress in October. Uh, and within here, uh, there are, you can see here these boxes, and these boxes are panels. And these panels are just information units to show uh, information within the system and within that uh, you can simply have an information example as a report. So here is 
a report that they wanted to run. And you can imagine this being any different clinic within a school, or if it's warehoused, any multiple clinics around the world simultaneously gathering this data and it being warehoused in real time and accessible as intelligence to what's going on. So a few simple questions, and you can ask any question you wish, the whole database is exposed to you. Everything financial, clinical, <clears throat> administrative, otherwise if you have non-communicable disease information, social determinants, et cetera, and so forth. So this one, they wanted to see BMI class uh, by age group. And so you can see the BMI classes here. And each of these vertical lines is different age group. You should note that all of these data are fictitious. They actually mean nothing. They're for demonstration purposes only. And if I want to see <clears throat> further what this actually means and see the actual numbers, there's a little item here on the side that allows me to go to my detailed list. And I can actually see the report itself that I have created. So I can go back and forth between the visuals and the actual numbers. Another example here uh, is that of an ICDOS example. So with uh, Dr. Fontana, uh, also we created a, uh, a simple report that showed different stages. We grouped different stages of ICDOS carries and um, looked at different variables around them and sorted them accordingly. So I can look at patient age, BMI class, area, surface, et cetera. And again, all of this information is real time. So as the data is going into the system in any of the clinics around the world, this information is being updated. And again, I'm not limited to the questions that I ask. And they went further into some what I think are some interesting reports as well, looking at social determinants such as education and abuse, and looked at the influence of these factors on the development of caries risk uh, within patients and so forth. So it was some, uh, I think, a lot of fun, really interesting stuff. And uh, as we now start moving to launches of the system, we'll move beyond fictitious data and demonstration and start doing real research, which will be very exciting. From an individual provider level, it's the same concept I can look at here as a simple example. For myself, I'm interested in, again, all this is fictitious, of looking at patients with severe pain, and I'm interested in diabetes and comparing patients with DM diabetes to those patients who don't across different age ranges. And so this is something that not for the whole institution, this is something that I as an individual practitioner am interested in. And so I have this on my own dashboard. I can have as many different reports running and ask as many different questions as I am interested in and get quite detailed. This one's quite simple. And again, as information is going into the system throughout, that information is coming back to me. On a patient level, uh, I can, uh, I'm just going to take a look at a particular patient. A couple items with regards to the patient. There is uh, within the type of data that you put, you put in, you can have standard oral health data for sure. Uh, but there's a patient management area, which when an administrator creates a patient, if you wish, a series of questions can come up and you can create whatever questions you wish. But there's a series of social determinant questions that we were asked to put in as an example of information uh, that can be then entered and made available for reports. And so you can see a series of questions around um, homelessness concerns, around abuse, around feeling unsafe and so forth. So you can enter that as part of your patient creation or you can enter that information as part of assessment questions in a report within the patient record if you so want. So you can do these as forms, they're traditionally called forms, or part of the patient creation process to make sure that data is put in. From a direct patient level uh, item, a couple of things to show you around data accessibility and access and customization. If you are working with caries risk assessment and or oral cancer risk or any other assessment that you would like as a researcher and or as a practitioner for patients, you can see the data from this assessment at any point in time. But what the collaboration asked for and the working group specifically requested was that they wanted to see trending information as opposed to one time, if you will, or static data. So with any assessment you want with your patient, you can see how information or how they're trending and you can see every data point. And as I showed earlier, of course, you can actually see those numbers. So depending on what your needs are, you can 
can look at that data on a specific patient. And of course, carries risk assessment information. You can look at across patients as well. Another item around this is the blood is the vitals information. Again, this is available for broader reports, but at a clinical base level, I can see how patients are trending on any vitals information, and I can see the actual date and timestamp and the actual data from any point as well within those items. So the concept of exposing data, enabling uh, an array, a broad range of, of data related to any patient, to be able to customize that without affecting the data structure has all been considered from day one, and that's very much on the collaboration. The company's been learning from them. They've provided incredible guidance to us, and so are essential in the successful use of the system from a research perspective, and we're most grateful. The last item, just as I finish up and turn it over to Heiko, is I just wanted to show you the concept of data entry into this and the use of standards. And I seem to have a very poor connection, so I apologize. It's taking uh, a bit of time for this chart to show up. So I apologize for that. And all I really wanted to show you was in working with the working group, uh, what the uh, collaboration thought through was the incorporation of the standard and then beyond just putting that information in, making that information available from a data perspective, but also making it easy for the, the clinician so that you would get your data. Because if you don't have a happy clinician, you won't have a happy researcher. So if I, for example, am observing lesions, they've got a, um, a, an odonogram here where I can identify any code, uh, any ICDOS code which I've gone to, I can select it very simply, and then I can select the tooth and or the teeth and areas uh, and um, surfaces where this applies, look through, simply add it, it informs immediately my odonogram, and informs immediately my treatment planning modules, and simultaneously, obviously, it becomes accessible in real time for reports. So that's a few items where uh, the collaboration has provided some, we think, elegant guidance for us from a data perspective. I welcome your questions, and we'll turn this over to Heiko. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, greetings from Sydney, um, and good morning. It's um, 6.30 a.m. here, and we will have 90 Fahrenheit today, just to make you envy. Obviously, we are following standards here in Australia and use the metric system and measure this in Celsius, um, just to point out. So, um, Mark, if you can go to the next slide. I wanted to start off with um, reminding, um, talking about that Atuga Wanda recently reminded us in a New Yorker article what health data is about and what it incorporates, and it's going far beyond the electronic health record. So he states that we have four kinds of different information about health and well-being, and I think the well-being part is really important. We're not just talking about sick people when we talk about health. So it's information about the state of your internal system, so from imaging, lab tests, results, but also genome sequencing. Then the state of your living conditions, your housing, community, economic data, environmental circumstances, market, Mark mentioned, uh, uh, social determinants of health, all that uh, kind of information. Then the state of the care you received, so what the practitioner has done to you, what medications you take and other treatments you have received. And then last but not least, the state of your behavior, your patterns of sleep, exercise, eating and so on. And we talked a little bit about, um, um, about the part with the Fitbits coming in here. And Atul Gavana closes his article with saying that the potential of this information is enormous and almost scary. And it's the first time that we can bring this potentially all together in a meaningful way, uh, far beyond uh, your annual checkups with the GP. So when we talk about what kind of data we can collect, uh, we always had the first class of data, which is traditionally in databases very structured data. But we also have a second class of data unstructured, such as voice, images, videos. And finally, we have the third class of data from the Internet of Things. Um, most consumers never see the data. Um, and they can be obviously used uh, now that we have a full gamut of sensors in these um, phones um, and other devices, which can be used as long as they 
uh, can be integrated into the um, electronic health record. And if we pull the camera back a little bit and see the big pictures, we can think about this that the internet really reshaped how humanity communicates and big data transforms how society processes information. So we have um, the internet of medical things um, on our next slide and Eric Topol um, um, coined that phrase, internet of medical things. Uh, we have more and more hyper-connected patients that are willing to share the data coming from credit card sized devices attached through their phones, usually through the cloud and hundreds of mobile apps can capture all this data and then upload it. Again, the real important part is how do we integrate this into the uh, electronic health record in a meaningful way. If you go to the next slide, you will see that we also have something which I call the Internet of Dental Things. Here the Colibri dental toothbrush, once you brush your teeth through your smartphone via Bluetooth, your brushing habits get uploaded. Um, I still have to hear that these data get integrated into an electronic dental record. So again, um, the question of data is the interconnectivity and the use of data, not just the collection of data. The next slide shows that we have uh, more and more sensors and uh, due to time reasons, I don't want to go into this. Um, they're usually connected through uh, mobile phones. And the next slide actually shows that um, kind of um, connection or pipeline here, um, finally ending up in this case via FISIQ in EPIC and um, Lynn talked about our efforts also, to, efforts also to integrate data into EPIC forward and backward to have the connectivity with the medical uh, record system because dentistry shouldn't stand as a silo. On the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about traditional electronic health records. Um, and we always have stored data in big databases there. And what do get these electronic health records right uh, for dentistry? So they're really good at billing. Uh, they clearly have improved legibility when you compare to paper. There's clearly better availability. You don't have to chase up records. All the entry systems work really well. And alerts and reminders work well. So what do they get wrong at the moment? And I start again with alerts and reminders, which seem a little bit illogic, but we have too many of these. There's clearly alert fatigue everywhere. Um, data entry is often tedious and redundant. Uh, just think about each time you take a medical history of your patients. Um, I'm pretty sure the physician or GP has done the same thing a week earlier and put it into the medical record. Um, records are often incomplete. Uh, while we suffer from um, data overload, um, also note bloat when you use um, templated notes, you have often too much text, nobody can read that. And it's very hard to navigate between these different screens. Um, so um, let's conceptually think about the electronic health record. So what is it actually? Um, information technology is first of all a transport mechanism. It carries digital information just as Railroads carry goods and power grids carry electricity. And like any transport mechanism, it's far more valuable when it's shared uh, rather than it's used in isolation. So the history of information technology has been a history of increased interconnectivity and interoperability from the mainframe time sharing to local area health networks to the internet. So I see the electronic health record as a transport mechanism for patient information. And again, transport mechanisms benefit from interoperability. Think about the railroad. So here, um, we, a few years ago, we looked at what uh, information needs dentists have, and I don't want to dwell too much on our own research here, but several themes emerged that uh, dentists really look for timely access to information on various subjects, not just on the teeth. Uh, better visual representation of the dental problems. They want to have access to patient-specific evidence-based information. So not a pointer to and a link to PubMed, um, but something which connects to their patient at hand. And they want to have accurate, complete, and consistent documentation of the patient records. So all that um, 
um, triggered obviously the search for um, um, the log for a meaningful electronic health record. So data can guide the scientific process and that ranges from the public health official and policymaker down to the private practitioner if we manage to harness the data that we routinely collect in the care process. So we really want to support uh, the clinician who want to see the whole human being, not just the mouth and the teeth. Data can help us to transition from the focus on production to the focus on outcomes. Um, we have behaving a little bit like bean counters, if you think about this. Um, we're really proud if we place more fillings this year than last year. But in doing this, we often forget that um, this is really just counting how often we failed in our prevention efforts. Um, so I think we need to keep that in mind when we talk about data. So what barriers do we have currently? And it's on the next slides. Um, um, smartphones can do so many things and electronic health records can do only a few things. Um, just think about what your iPhone or smartphone connects with each other, how many apps sit on it, um, how the sensors are shared. Uh, we have clearly a lack of interoperability if you compare this uh, with the electronic health records. Um, and this is just an example. Um, but it's really complicated uh, when we want to ask real questions. And I would consider real questions like, um, where do we go for delivery of a child when the mother has Addison's disease? Um, where is a suitable clinical trial for a newly discovered cancer or a cancer in one of our patients? Um, and where's the best mental health treatment for an adult with ADHD? Um, so these are all questions which in theory should be able, uh, our electronic health record infrastructure should be able to answer, but it can't. So if you think about this in the bigger picture, we can see how do we ensure that these electronic repositories become valuable resources rather than expensive investments that are quickly ignored by the clinician and only used by the billing folks. Um, on the next slide, we also see that on this brave new world of um, um, electronic health record and artificial intelligence has also unintended consequences. And I can give a two hour talk about unintended consequences um, because there are many of them, but I just want to point out one here. If you need to keep that in mind that the over-reliance on technology could also tempting us um, um, to rely on it so much that eventually we are de-skilling. And we need to be aware of this. Um, surgery um, has already experienced this through robotic surgery that uh, new trainees don't have enough opportunities. Um, I clearly have trouble uh, finding my way around without my GPS in my car. Um, so we need to keep that in mind uh, when we use technology. But we have more and more uh, informatics tools that help us. And I've put on the next slide um, um, a quote for a recent article from, uh, which was in the New England Journal, that the medical thinking has become vastly more complex and mirroring the changes in our patients, our healthcare system and in medical science, the complexity of what's out there clearly exceeds the human mind. There's no way that we can analyze all this and uh, have this in our mind without support. And there are obviously um, uh, many implications for all this um, in the industry. If you think about Invisalign, a um, good example of something can, which can be done only with computers. There's no way you could do this in your head or with skills. Um, and that's obviously one very um, specific example only. Um, we have um, we have to think about this and need to be aware of this, that um, our students will ask questions, uh, will um, dental providers be pushed to the sidelines, um, will, they de will they be displaced? And I personally don't think so, at least not in the short run. Uh, but we need to keep these conversations open and, and be uh, mindful of them. Uh, I'm pretty sure 10 years ago, if you would have asked a cabbie, if his job was in danger, he would say, no way, uh, you always need uh, cab drivers. Um, nowadays, it looks a little bit differently. And we also um, need to be in an open discussion about these topics. So if we think about on the next slide what data can be done, uh, and I often cite this example because I find it really intriguing. 
Um, so here, um, Mayo Clinic, United Health Group, it's a big insurance company, and Optos Lab, it's a bunch of very smart people, reproduced a $300 million trial that ran for five years using their data and their vast um, databases in just a few hours. So keep kind of think about this. So they, what was done for a lot of money in a long time, they reproduced in a few hours and they came to the same results. Um, not only would it have saved time to do it this way, but it also during the five years, presumably you could have um, saved uh, lives already following these new guidelines or outcomes of this trial. So when will we be able in dentistry to pull off something similar? I think we still have to think a little bit about that. Um, when we talk about data availability in a clinical setting, we often just talk and think about so that the dentist sits in front of a computer and looks uh, up how deep the root canal um, instrumentation was in the last session. But it goes far beyond that. We need to involve patients um, by making them part of the decision-making process. We need to uh, obviously provision data to the clinician so that they can make the right decision at the point of care uh, with embedded evidence-based uh, um, medicine principles. Uh, we need to think about service provision, how do we allocate um, resources safely and quality. And we also need to keep the politicians in mind, the policy makers, how can we best um, um, ration limited resources. And that brings me to my last topic I want to briefly touch upon, and I'm pretty sure many of you have heard about the learning health system. Uh, it's a notion which uh, was um, initiated a few years ago by an IOM report, Best Care at Lower Cost, the Path to Continuous health, Learning Healthcare in America. Um, and allow me just to read one sentence um, from this, because that's at the heart of what we try to accomplish here in the collaboration um, and moving towards a learning health system. The foundation for a learning healthcare system is the continuous knowledge development, improvement and application. Although unprecedented levels of information are available, patient and clinicians often lack, lack access to guidance that is relevant, timely and useful for the circumstances at hand. And I think that sentence, or actually two sentences, are at the heart of what we try to accomplish and where we want to go. So if you look, for instance, at the next slide, it is extremely obvious that we need to connect the medical and the dental record. If you want to bring healthy lives and healthy mouths together, you need to bring electronic medical records and electronic dental records together. If we don't do this, this, I don't think we can really claim that we have safe and efficient patient care and um, that we can advance biomedical research and knowledge. So this is one of the um, pillars of um, our decision making process and our design in the collaboration. Uh, I had recently a discussion with NIDCR about some topics around data and a um, couple of questions which came up for which we currently don't have really good answers. Is maintaining a full dentition important for the older patient? I'm um, pretty sure there are many editorials about that, but what are the data uh, here? Does pre-chemo dental therapy really help? What is the role of the dentition um, in uh, dialysis patients and the outcome? Um, and does dentition, healthy dentition, really improve overall health? Um, we all have intuitions about these questions, but do we really have answers? On the next slide, you see what uh, was already referred to today, um, the 17 lag time, 17 years lag time between um, um, uh, discovery and usage uh, of uh, the data. Um, I sometimes say tongue in cheek that we came already a, a long way here. Uh, many of you know um, the story of Ignaz Semmelweis, the Hungarian physician who observed that simply washing hands could drastically reduce high rates of maternal death during childbirth. And um, it took us 164 years until half of the clinicians in the US actually washed their hands before seeing a patient. And now we know that it takes 17 years um, to, um, uh, from discovery to implementation. Um, Lynn and I postulated a few years ago at an IDR workshop that we should get to 17 months. But in order to do this, we need to do what's on the left side 
uh, when you think about the learning health system, we can't study data, analyze them, interpret results, and write a paper. We have to do what's in the upper left corner here um, of the slide. We have to develop a tailored message and take actions in the health system. We can't stop with writing a paper. And the learning health system accomplishes this by having uh, five characteristics, which are displayed on the next slide. Every patient characteristic and experience is available for study. Obviously, privacy and consent um, provided. Best practice knowledge is immediately available to support and decision making. The improvements are continuous through ongoing studies, and this happens routinely and economically without much fuss uh, as part of the culture. So um, I want to show in the next slide, um, and I would encourage you to read this um, paper by Friedman, Rubin, and Sullivan, um, that the learning health system is a socio-technical system. It's not just an electronic health record, with the primary goal of uh, safely improving healthcare by reducing uh, the cost and um, re um, also reducing harm. Um, it is the purposeful collection of data also outside the care experience and it comes back to integrating other data. Uh, so we just shouldn't look only at the um, hospital settings and what happens in the hospital. And I, due to time, I don't want to go into the details, but it's essentially based on Edward Deming's work, a pioneer of systems thinking who said, it is not good enough to do your best. You must know what you do and then do your best. So with this, I want to come to the last slide and um, open the discussion about what would an electronic health record system for dentistry look like that dentists suddenly can't live without anymore. Uh, and I think that's a big question and that's what we at least in the collaboration for FID try to tackle. Thank you very much. Annalise, do you want to moderate the discussion? Sure, I can. Um, I believe that I also sent you guys the questions, but I can also okay. get the ball rolling. Um, the first question says, as I understand it, this is designed to remain a closed ICE EPIC system that would communicate to other systems like Densfly or Salud by HL7 FHIR. What is meant by closed? It's, it's Mark here. And Mark, I, I, try I, sure, absolutely, so I, I concur with Lynn. The, the concept was open. Uh, and so using fire uh, and uh, ICE will integrate with and is integrated with many systems now and will continue to uh, the system itself ICE is built entirely on APIs and so has the ability to interoperate if you will with any electronic medical system but then any other data gathering tool uh, in or outside of dentistry anywhere so the concept really is what data do uh, professionals require uh, from where uh, do they wish to require that data? And then as long as uh, there is an interoperable uh, friend, if you will, on the other side, we can integrate with it. There, it, The concept has not been a closed system at all. It's been to entirely open up uh, communication data opportunities. And, and to expand a little bit further to the learning health system, by the time we attain that, which is going to be down the road, absolutely, but data will need to be flowing among systems pretty fluidly. So ICE is built to do that carefully. So while Mark reads the next question, um, maybe in the chat, I can answer one, uh, which I see in the chat, and it's about uh, that there was very little interest when you when you treat uh, as a dentist medically compromised patients from the medical side. And I think we all have experienced this. And, and I think a lot of this has to do with culture change. So there are more execution barriers than technical barriers in that whole space. And I think it needs to put a lot of pressure on us as educational institutions 
to really instill in the students team-based care and interprofessional learning experiences to prepare them for a world where they are not um, um, where they have to work in a team and, and, and are not solo practitioners. Uh, so there's a lot of cultural change necessary. But I think increasingly uh, there's pressure also on the healthcare delivery system. If you think about legislation uh, pushing towards uh, value-based care, uh, more outcomes, um, focus on outcomes, less uh, focus on production and uh, doing just procedures. So I think this is a complex area of culture change and it will require several different avenues to push for this and um, persuade and change behavior. Obviously, behavior change is uh, very hard to achieve, much, much harder than building uh, electronic health record systems. Mark would probably disagree with this, but um, uh, culture is the big thing. Yeah, that's a really good point. The technology is easy. The culture change is difficult. And Mark, I just wanted to see if you saw the question on telehealth capability within ICE EHR. The question is, is this limited to sharing patient records between clinicians, e.g. specialist to general practitioner? Or also, could it be used for patient consultations and education purposes? In the case of the latter, would this mean one needs an extended module that is in direct hand of a patient, e.g. in personal computer and mobile phone? Um, a beautiful question and, and an insightful question, actually. So the uh, the concept, the collaboration working group around telehealth uh, thought through the concept of community-based clinical instruction and education, uh, mentoring of colleagues and peers throughout the world, as well as direct patient consultation and telehealth support. And they thought through these multiple applications and help define and design the technology inside of the health records so that the people conducting uh, the communications through the telehealth component had immediate and instant access within a proper secure framework to the whole of the patient record. Uh, so as such, uh, it, you are certainly uh, able to, and applications are now beginning to launch that cover direct patient consultation, that cover mentoring of colleagues, as well as cover instruction of students and supervision of students in remote locations. And the data, of course, from all of that is available as well. And I think there was one other question. Can ICE incorporate and calculate scales such as the oral health impact profile for each patient? Uh, yes, it can. So the um, there is uh, within the reports uh, there and the types of forms you can calculate and incorporate scales accordingly. Uh, in an upcoming release, it's going to get a little more sophisticated, so it becomes uh, useful at a, at a deeper level. Uh, but the answer short is yes. Okay, we had one last question. Um, and that was if the slides can be available for the participants. And the answer is yes. Um, mm -hmm. They will be available uh, either sometime later today or tomorrow, and we will send them to everybody registered a PDF version of these slides. Uh, the presenters have graciously agreed to make them available to us. Um, and so with that, I just want to thank Dr. Spalik, Dr. Thompson, and Dr. Jenis for joining us today for this webinar. It was incredibly informative, and we appreciate you guys taking the time to speak to um, all of the, the participants here in the Rodeo webinar series. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for hosting us. Absolutely. And thank you for everybody who attended. Uh, if you'd like a recording of the webinar, it will be available on the Rodeo website soon. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Stay warm. <laughs> yes. Stay warm. That really hurts, Psycho. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.